Hey, this is Jamie with Stillmeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about my favorite multiplayer games that play really well at two players. Uh, this isn't necessarily a list of games that play better at two players than higher player counts, but uh, that did impact my thinking a little bit here. I'll talk about some of the different factors that made me think about this as I go through the list. So let's just jump right in. Um, actually, some honorable mentions. I asked our ambassadors and champions to offer some of their suggestions for games in this category. It's kind of hard to search for. And some games that didn't quite make the list because I maybe haven't played them. Well, actually, honestly, I just haven't played them at two players in a while um, or at all. Dominion. Dominion, I had played at two players. I wouldn't quite put it on this list uh, just out of... Out of uh, just because I wouldn't put it on my top 10 list. I haven't played Everdell, Five Tribes, Mansions of Madness, or Terraforming Mars at only two players. Um, it's possible they could make the list. Other people seem to like them. There are multiple people that said they like them for this list, but um, I haven't played them at two players. So my number 10 is a game that I don't own. I actually own a lot of games on this list, but not this one, and that is Bunny Kingdom which is a great drafting game. It's a wonderful drafting game where you are choosing two cards to play, not just one like in many drafting games. You're choosing two cards from a hand, and you're passing the remainder of your hand to the other player or the player to your left. In a two-player game, there's only one other player, so you're kind of passing them around the table. Um, so there's a lot of nice interaction through that draft. There's plenty of interactions on the board in Bunny Kingdom. I can't even quite... Uh, some of these games, I can definitely put my finger on why I like it at two players. Bunny Kingdom, I like it at multiple players, but I also had a really fun time playing it at just two players. So I wanted to put it on this list uh, as an as a enjoyable game at two players um, that also scales up to higher player counts. And that is Bunny Kingdom. My number nine game on this list is The Isle of Cats. And this falls into a great category. Actually, another does have drafting. It does have drafting. I, I wouldn't say the drafting is, is the focus of, of why it's on my list here. So this is a drafting game where you are using uh, Tetris polyomino tiles to fill up your ship. And the reason I put it on this list, and you'll see this about a few other games too, is that in a two-player game, you actually have a little bit more control over which tiles you get, or there's a better chance that you'll get certain tiles that you want. And that feels good um, in a two-player game. So the, there are a bunch of tiles that you put out on the, on the table on either side of uh, the, the scoring board in Isle of Cats. And those are the only tiles available for that round. And so in a two-player game, there might be a few tiles that I want, and I have a much greater chance of getting at least one of those tiles in a two-player game, opposed to a three- or four-player game where that chance goes down quite a bit that, that I actually get one of the tiles that I really want. Um, so it puts actually, in a higher player account game, it puts more impetus on being the first player. But, uh, but I just like the two-player version. I, I think that works really well with the two-player version of Isle of Cats. That's why it's on this list at my number nine slot. My number eight game on the list is another one that I own, and that is a very similar, actually, reason as Isle of Cats. That is Spirits of the Forest. There's actually a Kickstarter for this right now um, for the expansion. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. This is a great abstract game. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I played it at higher player counts and at two player counts. And for the same reason that I liked Isle of Cats, in Spirits, Spirits of the Forest, I have an extra sense of control. Um, may even just be a really a feeling of control. It's not, and control isn't even quite the w right word. But basically, when I, I can plan ahead for my turn better um, in the hopes of getting something that I really want. Because the board state hasn't completely changed. In fact, this is a little different than Isle of Cats, but the board state hasn't completely changed by the time it gets around to me in a two-player game because only one thing has changed. Basically, there's a there's a big there's a bunch of rows of tiles in the middle of the board, and on your turn, you select one or two of those tiles, and then that's it. That's pretty much all that you're doing on your turn. There's one other thing that you can do on your turn, but that's the main thing that's happening. And in a four, three or four-player game. Um, you, you, you kind of just wait for your turn to see what's available at that point uh, because the tiles that you choose are dependent on what's, what's exposed on the edges of the board at that time. In a two-player game, um, you can have backup plans. You can have only really two plans. You only need two plans, and if the other player chooses one of those things, you can go with the backup or go with whatever they exposed right away. It just, I think, flows a little bit better in a two-player game, and uh, that's why it stands out to me as a game that I really enjoy at two players. That's Spirits of the Forest, kind of a tile selection, set collection game. Number seven on this list is The Legacy of Dragonhold. This is a choose-your-own-adventure cooperative game with wonderful storytelling, wonderful writing, 
and uh, it uh, I've had just a great time playing it, playing some of the missions with only two players. It uh, I think I, I'd compare this actually to Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective in terms of how it feels to play two players. Uh, there's a famous, I think, shut up and sit down review of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective where people just kind of took their time, the two players talked about how they just took their time and talked about it and had just a wonderful narrative experience with the game. Um, and that's how we played, how I played two, a, two, a few two player games of Legacy of Dragon, Dragon Hall. We just kind of took our time with it and really enjoyed the experience. We only had to worry about the other person's character. Discussions were really easy because there were only two of us discussing things, and I, I had a great time playing it at two player counts. Um, yeah, Legacy of Dragon Hall plays really great at two players. I have played it at higher player counts too. Number six on the list is probably the most mentioned game uh, when I when I polled our ambassadors with this question. I, it wasn't really a poll, it was a fill in the blank. Fill in any, your favorite multiplayer game that uh, you can play with only two players. And the game that came up the most was Castles of Burgundy, one of the most famous Stefan Feld games, and probably my favorite Stefan Feld game. And Castles of Burgundy is a dice selection game. You're choosing dice off these actions and, and then placing tiles on your mat. Um, and it, it just works really well at two players. I, I, I can't even quite describe why it does. It just uh, it, it scales really, really well. It plays just as well, I think, at three or four players. Maybe it takes a little bit longer. And that's actually one of the benefits of a two-player game uh, with these multiplayer games. You can play it much faster with two players than a, than a longer game. But Castle of Burgundy just happens to flow really, really well at two players. As I'm saying that, I'm thinking that I've also played Sulk in two players with Megan and had a really great experience with that as well. Uh, but Sulk makes almost all my lists, so I'm not going to add it to the last minute on this list. That's the Castle, Castles of Burgundy at number six. And just to let you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about Stomeyer games and two-player games at the end of, the, end of this list. Um, and also, I should mention here that I do have another list of games to, that only play with two players. And uh, you can check out that list. I'll, I'll, if I remember, I'll link to it below so you can check out that list. But you can also search for my favorite two-player games and see what that list is. Those are games that only play at two players. Anyway, on to number five on my list, and that is Sagrada, another abstract game. Sagrada is a game that scales, with an expansion, I think it scales up to five or six players, six players total, but I really enjoyed it too. It is a dice drafting game. Kind of seeing a drafting theme on this list, aren't we? It's a dice drafting game um, where you roll the number of players plus one is the number of dice that, you're, uh, that you roll. So there's always... Even the last player always has a choice. You always have two dice to choose from. Um, but the draft flows really easily. I select one, you select two, then I select one, and the extra die marks that we have um, played that round. Other than that, there aren't really any interactions in Sagrada. That's the main interaction. Um, there are some interactions with like the special abilities on the, on the table, which actually I think work better at lower player counts. But... Uh, but I just think the game flows really well at two players. It's very easy to get to the table. I enjoy it at higher player counts too, but the drafting just is a little smooth, extra smooth at two players, and I really enjoy that. I've had a great time with Sagrada at five players, and that's why it's at two players, and that's why it's number five on this list. That is Sagrada. Let me look at my design notes here to see what else I should mention. Um, Sagrada might be a good one. Yeah, I'll mention that for Sagrada. Uh, value, I think, comes into play when I when I consider multiplayer games that I'm primarily going to play at two or that I might be playing at two players. Because I love it when games scale down to two players so that I have that option. And I think Sagrada is a great example of the value. Sagrada isn't a super expensive game. I, I think maybe it's $40. You can probably get it at a discount. And I think that works, uh, I think that works really, really well uh, for the value proposition. If I'm going to buy a game um, I, I, that scales down to two, I, I want to be able to get a good value out of that game. I, I want it to, I don't want the price to be too high. However, there are exceptions to that. There are games that I'd play pl plenty of money for if, as long as I know that I can also play at higher player counts when those opportunities arise, especially after the pandemic ends. And I can have my game night again. So anyway, yeah, let's get on to number four on the list. And that is the biggest box here. That is Glenmore 2 Chronicles. This one, I didn't know if it would play well at two players um, because it's a, it's a tile, well, it's a worker movement game where you're moving a worker around a one-way uh, worker placement um, um, track 
one of my favorite mechanisms. This one uses tiles on that track where you're selecting a tile, you're gaining a tile based on where you move and you can't go back to tiles that you passed over. One of my favorite mechanisms. I love that mechanism. But I wasn't sure if you, how well it would work with two players, especially since um, you compare yourself to the, to the other players at, at the end of each round in several categories, like how many, how much whiskey you have, I think, not how much money you have, but how many uh, characters you have, how many tiles you have, stuff like that. You compare yourself to the other players, and the points that you gain depend on that comparison, uh, especially compared to the lowest player at the table. But as it happens to be, that scales really well for two players because uh, you, you are always comparing yourself to each other. Um, so that, that there's a really nice player interaction there that just, just works really well with two players. You don't need a bunch of players for that mechanism to work if you are comparing yourself to the other players. Um, I've heard this actually talked about, I think Rado has talked about this in terms of area control or area majority in two-player games, where if you don't have that compare, or when you do have that comparison, or even when you don't, if there, sometimes you need a dummy player in there to compare yourselves against, because otherwise, like, the first player, the first place player might score a ton of points just for having one or two tokens in a certain section of the board, whereas with a lot more players, you might need seven or eight player tokens in that in that category to control it. But with this comparison, the way that Glenmore compares it to the lowest player, uh, that works really, really well. Uh, so yeah, anyway, Glenmore works really, really well at two players. That's my number four on this list. Uh, let's see, yeah, what's next? We're down to the top three, all of which I own. They're on a stack right here in front of me. Um, my number three on the list is Fantastic Factories. This actually is a game that scales up really well because a lot of the play is simultaneous. You are uh, building an engine and then rolling some dice and simultaneously with all, with all the other players, you are running that engine. You're putting dice down. You are uh, sometimes drawing cards from the top of the deck, but there's no interaction during that phase in terms of face-up cards. Um, you're mostly just deciding how to allocate your dice and how to run your engine as best as possible and deciding which cards to play. We just had a blast with it at two players. How much does it scale? I think it scales up to it scales up to five players. But down at two, it hums along. It works really, really well. Um, and yeah, we've. I think I think it's because of that simultaneous play that it does work at the higher player counts, but does work really well at two players. Highly recommend this game, especially among engine building games. It's quick. It's fun. It plays just really, really well at two players and up to up to five players. Fantastic factories. Down to the top two here. Um, this It was really close here because one of these games is essentially a dueling game, but Shards of Infinity says on the box that it is a two to four player game. And it does. It comes with enough characters to play with four characters um, four, or four players. And I think that would be fine. I haven't tried it, but I think that would be fine. But it is fantastic at two players. We have played the competitive version once at two players and the cooperative version a ton of times at two players. The cooperative expansion is fantastic in this game. I was talking about value earlier. This game has one of the best value propositions of any game because it has a ton of replayability with a variety of cards, the things you can do. And with the expansions, which aren't all that exp expensive, they add a ton more replayability and a ton more variety to the game. Uh, the value is fantastic. Yeah, it does play up to four. I don't know if I'd really seek it out at four, but uh, but the two-player version of Shards of Infinity is fantastic, and I really, really like it. This is a deck-building game. You can watch my video about it if you like it, but it's a deck-building game where it does something really, really awesome with this mechanism called Mastery, where on your turn, instead of just like building your engine or attacking the other player, as you can do in, in games of this ilk, you can also level up your Mastery, which is just a, a number that you accumulate until you get to the point where mastery starts to improve the cards that you're playing. It actually makes the cards better. Uh, and while you're doing so, it also makes uh, gives you the chance, if you get to 30 mastery, of dealing infinite damage, which is awesome. Uh, that's my favorite mechanism in the game. Scales really well up to two. I would say that uh, if you aren't into competitive two-player games, because you are bashing each other in this game, you are dealing each other damage, that uh, the cooperative... Ver expansion is ne is necessary that's what megan and i that's how we found our love for the game but it's so inexpensive to add to the game that i think it totally counts for this number two slot and that is shards of infinity my number one slot here number one is the beautiful game parks love parks i've played it at five players and thought it was fine I, was, I was like, oh wow, this is a really well-designed game, but I'm a little frustrated because in Parks, it's another game like Glenmore that has a one-way 
uh, worker movement selection track where you're moving ahead as far as you want, gaining the bonus on tile, and then uh, and then that's your turn. Um, it works fine at higher player counts, but it's a lot tighter. There's a lot of lot more people in front of you taking the stuff that you want. Whereas in a two-player game, it's a lot more flexible. It's a lot more open um, and a, a lot more options. I think there are some two-player games where it's great that you have fewer options. It's great that it feels a little tighter. But in parks, I want it to be a little bit looser. It's parks. Look at the theme. It's pleasant. It's wonderful. I, I, I want to feel relaxed while I'm playing parks, while having strategic decisions. And that's what I get from the two-player version. I really do. I love how, how it opens up the game to have those extra slots open in, in the two-player experience. And we have just had a blast playing Parks. This is, I actually slot it into my two-player shelf because I only want to play Parks at two. That's where it belongs on my shelf. And uh, it's such a beautiful game. Yeah, if you, and, and the value is great too. It's, a, it's not a huge box. I think the game is maybe 40 or $50, um, but it, it's, it's definitely worth the have if you are looking for a, a game that you can at times play with higher player counts, but you're primarily going to play it too. Parks is my recommendation. I've had a blast with it. So that's my number one, Parks. One thing I wanted to mention, one thing that I don't think you heard on this list, let me make sure that there, I'm not saying this incorrectly. Yeah, I don't think there are any dummy players on this list because that's one thing that sometimes happens in solo games and sometimes two-player games where you have a dummy player where they have their their uh, their tokens on the board, their meeples on the board or, or whatever. they And that's actually Tolkien. So why Tolkien maybe didn't make this list. Tolkien does have dummy players, and they work fine. You don't have to manage them. In fact, one of our new our, our new game, Pendulum, Pendulum at the two-player count, does have dummy players, but you don't have to manage them. You just kind of put them on the board at the beginning of the game, and they're there. But if I have to manage a dummy player, I just I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to spend my time doing that. I want to focus on my strategy and the wonderful other person that I'm playing the game with, not a dummy player that isn't there. So that's one thing to keep in consideration for scaling. In fact, I would rather have a looser game um, than have a dummy player that makes the game tighter. I am okay with a game feeling differently at different player counts. I think that's one of the great things about games, that games don't have to feel identical at every player count. I'm, I'm fine with the game being a little looser or a little tighter when, when it's better that way um, at, a, at, at two players. What else here? Oh, Stonemaier Games. So Stonemaier Games, one of the reasons, one of the core philosophies of Stonemaier Games, my company, is that we want our games to be playable at two players uh, for, for, for the reason that we know that a lot of people maybe only have that experience of playing with one other player. Uh, they might play with their significant other, their roommate, or there might be only one person in their life that really enjoys games. So we want you to be able to play our games at two players. All of our games must play well at two players and in fact a lot of people often ask me like does that really scale down to two players and a lot of our play testing especially our local play testing for a long time has happened just between me and my business partner alan uh, now joe is in the company so we can play test three player games more uh, frequently but a lot of the multiplayer testing happens with blind play testers who are play testing at larger groups so a ton of focus really does go into making our games play well at, at the two player count um and then all of our games also scale up to at least five players. So we really wanted to play well at those higher player counts too, but also down to two players. One of the things that we've done in recent years with a few of the games, Tapestry and Pendulum actually, both have boards that are double-sided that scale based on player count. I think that makes it really easy for players to, uh, for, for a game designer to have a little bit of control over the differences in like a tighter map for two players say, or, um, or a, a bigger map for more player counts. In Pendulum, it's a worker placement game. So there are some consolidated actions for the two and three player side, whereas those are separate actions on the other side of the board. And I think that's really great. It means that players don't have to really remember anything different. All they have to do is flip the board to the right side and start playing. I think it is important that you make it very clear, printed on the board, which player count is appropriate for that side. So you don't have to refer to the rule book. But I think that's a great solution uh, for games. And I, I was actually hesitant to do that for a long time because I, I, I am okay with games playing differently um, at different player counts. But I think it does, if you have a map involved 
or if you have a worker placement board where a scarce, scarcity of options is necessary, um, that having different sides of the board for those different player counts is a great solution for that. It does mean that you might have to play, pay extra for art or graphic design because you are doing something different. And it also leads to a slightly higher chance of human error in that process because say late in the process, you change something on the map or the board for one side, you have to also remember to change it on the, on the other side, even if it's a little graphical thing. So you have like double the work and double the things to remember. Just something from the publisher side to keep in mind of when you when you make that decision. Because there are other ways to scale as well. Like with Viticulture, we have a, a certain one action, one action space per action for one or two player games. And then once you get up to three or four player games, you have two action spots. And they're all printed on the board. It isn't like a double-sided board. Those action spots are printed on the board. And for five or six players, you have three action spots available per action. That's another way to scale it. Uh, one other thought here is that we have we do have a few games that play primarily at three to seven players. Those are between two cities and between two castles. However, because of our requirement, we needed them to also be a lot of fun at two players and one player uh, for between two cities. But two players in particular, we needed them to be functional and fun. So we found, uh, we made, designed uh, really good two player, in my opinion, really good two player variants for those games. Um, but we didn't want we wanted I guess, basically truth in advertising. And so on the box we printed, this is a three, we say these games are three, play at three to seven players and there are variants for one and two players. So we didn't, I think that's something that, that publishers can do. If, if the game is primarily designed at certain player counts, but it also, play, it also functions and is fine and is fun at other player counts, just mention that on the box. Say this game is primarily for, for three to seven players and there's a one or two player variant in the box. That's what we do for Between Two Cities, Between Two Castles. I've gone through almost all of our games here. What am I missing here? Uh, My Little Scythe, uh, that, that scales fine, fine down to two players. Um, um, yeah, I know I'm missing a few games. Euphoria. Euphoria has been the one game of ours that I think actually scales up better. It does function fine at two, but there are some really fun interactions that happen um, when you have more players. Uh, in, in Euphoria. And it actually even speeds up the game because you're, you're bumping workers in it. it the, the bump can happen faster. Oh, Wingspan, of course. Wingspan, one of our latest games. Uh, Megan and I love playing that at two players. We have a great time playing Wingspan at two players. And uh, that would have, if, if it wasn't a game that some of our games published, that definitely would have made this list because it plays really, really well at that player count. I also really enjoy Viticulture at two players. I think it, it scales uh, really well down to two players. And Tapestry, we've had fun playing Tapestry as well. Oh, and Scythe. Scythe, Scythe. I'm forgetting the big guns here. Wingspan, Scythe. Scythe, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we, we play tested Scythe a ton at two players. And a lot of people ask, like, why didn't you have different sides of the boards for Scythe? One is the art. Jakob spent like a month working on the art for the board. It's a huge file in, 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 on his computer. But um, part of the reason is it's a specific part of a world, a, 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 an alternate universe. And that world isn't smaller when you have other players come in. It's the same size, when you, no matter what your, your player count is, uh, thematically. And so what we did inside is we use kind of the Kemet system of letting you jump across the board using the tunnels. So even though there is more space to spread out inside than a two player game, uh, the interactions can be, it, it's just as interactive if you want it to be. So basically for lower player counts, we wanted players to have the option of not interacting with each other if they wanted, just like the higher player counts, it's just a little bit looser. But if you want to attack the other player, if you want to have that type of, type of direct interaction, it's very easy to jump across the board to get to them using the tunnels in the game and some of the different mech abilities. So that I think is another way, instead of having multiple maps, you can just connect the board using like a tunnel system or some sort of warping system where you can jump across the board and then you give players the option. If they want to interact in that way, if they want to jump across and be near the other player, they can. If they enjoy just building their own engine in their own space, especially if both players enjoy that, they have that option too. I think that works well as well uh, for, for games like Scythe. I've rambled on here for quite a bit about the top 10 and, and about our games. I'd love to hear your thoughts on games that you really, really enjoy at two players that, uh, that also happen to play up to higher player counts. You don't have to, I hope I haven't done this, but you don't have to bash the game at those higher player counts. Um, but just, you know, let me know if you, if you think the game plays really well at two. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Thanks.